ASMR and uh, in this video we're going to be continuing our look through the Big Finish main range for monthly adventures and we're going to be continuing with the next four releases 20 to 23 um, we're returning after the brief four story run initial four story run with the eighth doctor back to um, individual adventures with the fifth sixth and seventh doctors um, so yeah we've got another four to talk about today so because these are, are not an you know ongoing uh, story like the eighth doctor stuff let's just uh, start crack on um, jump straight into uh, release number 20 Lou Garou um, which is a fifth doctor and a Turlo story uh, this is written by Mark Platt and it's um, it's set primarily in Rio in 2080 uh, and it features it, it's about um, the Doctor and Turlo um, uh, fighting werewolves basically so werewolves or werewolves, I think I say, I think generally I say werewolves, but sometimes I say werewolves, either way, they're fighting werewolves, werewolves, We're, I feel like I'm going to tie myself in knots here, um, uh, but yeah, so this is, uh, of course, the fifth doctor, um, the fifth doctor is interesting so far, um, kind of the most interesting so far, on audio in terms of companion wise because um, you know at this point 23 stories in um, if we include you know the four we're going to talk about today um, primarily the seventh doctor has had most of his stories have been with Ace he's had one story with Mel and one sidestep that had Ace but also included Bernice Summerfield um, and then the Sixth Doctor had one story with Perry um, one story with Frobisher and then has primarily uh, had stories with Evelyn his new audio companion but the Fifth Doctor there hasn't been that same sort of consistency with him. He's had, at this point now, two stories with um, uh, Turlo, one story with Perry, um, and I know the next story, um, uh, number 24, I Have the Scorpion, is another Perry story. He's had two no, three with Nyssa, but he's kind of, there's, there's a lack of consistency there in terms of who, who do you pair him with. I think because the Fifth Doctor very rarely had just the one companion, um, and um, they hadn't, they obviously at this point have not managed to get Janet Fielding on, uh, on involved. Um, so it's kind of weird the sort of cat companion dynamics you get with the fifth doctor but I enjoy Turlo, I think I prefer Turlo to Nyssa, I think I've talked previously that Nyssa is not one of my favourite companions um, I don't dislike her necessarily but I, I, I think I definitely do prefer Turlo um, if we're you know, singling out a doctor and a and one companion. Um, I prefer him with Turlo over Nyssa and Perry, I think. Um, for me, Perry's much more of a sixth doctor companion, of course. Um, but I thought this story was fun. I thought that it was interesting how the werewolves just sort of exist, like they just are werewolves. Um, and they just exist because the werewolves exist. Um, it's kind of a lack of sci-fi explanation which is 
in a way, quite odd. But I kind of like that fact. Um, what I also found was really interesting about this story um, is that there's a character whose name is Ilyana, I believe. Um, Il yeah, sort of Ilyana. It was um, voiced by Eleanor Bron, an actress called Eleanor Bron, who kind of has a little romantic thing with the Doctor. Um, and it kind of, they have a little fling. And this it sort of poses the question of like, you know, would the Doctor, she, for whatever reason, at the end of the story, I won't spoil it, but obviously doesn't end up coming with him and can't. For whatever reason, maybe that's because she dies, maybe it's a different reason, I, I won't say. But it kind of poses a question of like, would the Doctor have travelled with this woman and fallen in love with her? Would he have stayed where she was and, you know, um, to, to have a future with her? Um, Taylor also gets a bit of a love interest uh, in this story. Um, but it's quite fun. It's quite a fun dynamic because they're not just, this stuff isn't just in there. So they've both got a love interest for the sake of it. Like, they have these conversations. It's a little bit windy at the moment um, outside. So if you can hear sort of, sort of whistling or, or that sort of noise, uh, it'll be the wind. Um, but yeah, the love interests are not just there for the sake of having love interests. The Doctor and Turlo have conversations and they're like, yeah, we can... I think Turlo certainly instigates it, because the Doctor's not going to, is he? Especially not this Doctor. Um, and Turlo's like, Turlo is like, I can, I know what's going on here, like, we, maybe we need to, like, stop and to consider what's, you know, these women we're talking to and how we feel about them. I thought that was interesting, especially for the fifth Doctor, who is so, you know, not necessarily the doctor you think of when you think of like anxiety with with women and not being able to talk to women you know i think generally you you think about like the fourth doctor or maybe the eleventh doctor but you know the eleventh doctor had a wife the fourth doctor was just it seemed kind of aware of you know, attraction and love and stuff wasn't interested in it. Whereas the fifth Doctor, of course, that era of the show, you know, it's that thing of no hanky panky in the TARDIS and the idea of sex or people being romantically involved or attracted to each other is just not present in the show in that period. You know, even though you've got your companions dressed as they are and you've got you know, Nicola Bryant with her tits out every episode. Um, that's a little bit vulgar, isn't it? Sorry. But she's dressed in a particular way, um, very deliberately. Um, you know, by the production staff and, and, you know, and that's John Nathan Turner, who will have the female characters, you know, dressed for the dads, but there's no romanticism there, there's no, there's no, yeah, it's, it's a very sterile kind of TARDIS in that period of the show, um, and this story kind of challenges that, um, and I quite like that, I think, because it, you know, that's something that I do find with that era of the show, I like it, but sometimes it, it does just feel a bit sterile and lifeless and, and and I think the the sexlessness of it co contributes to that and so I like that aspect of this story and I like the the, the werewolf aspect and um and I, it was interesting the way it played with Turlo and um yeah I thought this was 
good, not my favourite so far, but I thought this was uh, good fun. Next, uh, we will move on to Dust Breeding, which is a seventh Doctor and Ace story. It's written by Mike Tucker. Um, uh, it also brings back the character of Bev Tarrant, who's voiced by Louise Faulkner, who appeared in the Genocide Machine. And um, uh, this one's, uh, I'm trying to recall exactly what happens in this one now. Um, there's a planet of dust, and dust is attacking people. Uh, but there's like art and stuff on this planet, and then there's this, this like fancy cruise ship, spaceship thing that's coming to the planet, and there's a guy on the planet who's a man in a mask who's called Mr. Sater, Mr. Sita, uh, spelled M-R-S-E-T-A, and he's voiced by Jeffrey Beavers. No prizes for guessing that it's the master um, in disguise, which weirdly I did not guess until not long before the reveal, um, even though he's voiced by Jeffrey Beavers and he's called Mr. Sater, like it's an anagram of master. Um, I just thought, well, maybe Mr. Maybe Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Beavers is just voicing a different character. And the fact that he's in a mask and not showing his face is just unrelated, I guess. <laughs> but of course, uh, this is not Anthony Ainley, who was alive at the time, I believe, and was, they originally wanted to get him, um, and it just didn't work out. Um, and so they write in that his um, possession of the... Uh, Dream House body from Dragon um, has been reversed and he's back to being this sort of husk, emaciated, crispy master. Um, this was okay. I think of the four that we're talking about today, it was the least um, impressive, I suppose, at least. I don't want to say least engaging, because that sounds like I wasn't paying attention. Um, but it's the one I have the, the least to say about, absolutely. Um, which, in a way, is quite nice, because I'm glad I'm able to talk about the Fifth Doctor one so positively, but the Seventh Doctor one is just okay, because previously it's felt like the Fifth Doctor stuff has been the weakest for me, and the Seventh Doctor stuff has been some of the strongest. You know, stories like The Fearmonger and um, The Fires of Vulcan. Um, and uh, Genocide Machine. You know, these are really strong stories. Um, and this was still decent, but... Uh, I... I uh, I've kind of forgotten some of the details, and kind of forgot some of the details not long after I listened to it, you know. That's the one, the kind of, the thing that's not necessarily a problem, but with reformatting these Big Finish main range reviews into this format, but I'm still listening to one a week, essentially, means that some of them I'm talking about more of a memory, but... If it's a good, strong story, um, you know, like Lugaru, I could, you know, if you if you push me to, I could, I think I could give you a brief, vague summary of the plot, sort of beat by beat. But I reckon I could do it. Whereas this, I'm not sure I could. It kind of blurred a bit in my head. Um, again, not a bad story, but. I don't have too much to say about this. It was decent, but unremarkable, is what I would say. Um, but nice to have the master, I suppose. Uh, and then we move on. The next two are both Sixth Doctor and Evelyn stories. So we start with Blood Tide, which 
is written by Jonathan Morris. Um, it's set. Um, oh, I forget when it's set, but it's set on the Galapagos Islands, and it features Charles Darwin, a young Charles Darwin. Um, so there's a historical aspect. It's a celebrity historical, um, which is very fun, and it also I think is a great celebrity historical that uses you know a sci-fi Doctor Who monster because it's not a pure historical. It's a celebrity historical, and in the same way that like it's kind of a good idea. Although I don't like the episode, the Shakespeare Code. It kind of makes sense to have Shakespeare fighting um, witches who use words as their magic. It makes sense to have Charles Dickens fight ghosts. It makes sense to have Charles Darwin in this story up against Silurians who, you know, obviously Charles Darwin, um, the... Um, creator I suppose um and the um what's the word I'm looking for the um he's the guy who came up with the theory of evolution and popularized it and you know really was the first challenge to the idea of um you know the Christian belief of God and and the Bible and the creation the story of creation from the Bible um and yeah, it, it was a really fun inclusion. The Silurians were, were pretty fun. Um, and I thought what this story did really well uh, as well was that it wasn't just... Um, the Silurians weren't just villains. They were characters. They were people. And, you know, the Silurians are really interesting when they're not just evil. They're a race of people who kind of feel like the planet should be theirs, but it's not anymore... And of course you have young ones who are like extremists and they're the bad apples who've ruined it for everyone else, but um you've got uh you know, they're not all it's not a black and white thing. Um I thought Charles Darwin was fun in this. It, it includes a murka, there's a murka in it. Um and it's a genuine threat. <laughs> um and yeah, I mean, I I know I said that some of the seven the Seventh Doctor stuff has been some of my favourites so far. Um, I said that a minute ago, but I will say that I think the most consistently strong uh, run of stories for a Doctor so far in the main range is the Sixth Doctor um, with Evelyn. Um, you know, their run, their run of stories with those two characters. You know, Marion Conspiracy, Spectre of Lanyon Moor, Apocalypse Element, uh, this story, Blood Tide, and the next story. I, are there any others I've missed? I don't believe so. Um, just a great run of stories. Evelyn's a brilliant companion. I really love her. She's got a great dynamic with Colin. Um, I just think it's very interesting to have a companion who's so totally different to the norm. And it kind of proves that you don't need a companion to be an alien for them to be different. Just don't make them, you know, just cast someone who's out of the general, like, age range or demographically your pick. Like, Evelyn is an older woman and she's still a capable companion. Um... I think it's a fantastic dynamic. I'd love for the show to do something like that. You know, if it's a younger Doctor, have an older companion. Um, sort of what they did with, like, Bradley Walsh and uh, John Bishop, but to even more of an extent, you know. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this story a, a great deal. I always, you know, I think the Silurians are good fun. Um... And, and it, they, I handled the stuff with Dar, Darwin really well. That They didn't give him a nudge. They didn't go, oh, well, mate, what about this? You know, Doctor Who didn't give him the idea of the theory of evolution. He came to that conclusion naturally. 
and also encountered Silurians and had this adventure. But the two, th you know, it's not. <clears throat> it's a bit like the episode Rosa, where like that could have gone terribly if Doctor Who had given Rosa the idea to stand up on the bus. And it's like, oh yeah, look, the Doctor's the reason racism is, you know, that, the bus boycotts and all that. Um, which they didn't do in that episode, fortunately, which would have been terrible. Uh, and it would have been bad to do that in the, to a much lesser extent, of course. But it would have taken that achievement and that notability away from Charles Darwin, the actual person. And it doesn't do that, which was good. Um, so yeah, this one was, was another strong one. Uh, and the final story is the first in an ongoing series, I believe. Um, with uh, The Forge and Nimrod and all this stuff. Project Twilight, written by Gavin Scott and Mark Wright, um, which is set sort of around about modern day 2001 um, in the South East London. Um, and the villains in this story are vampires. So within the space of four stories, you've got werewolves and vampires, uh, which is interesting. But it's another Colin Bake, it's another Sixth Doctor and Evelyn story. Um, I also really like there's a character in this uh, called Cassie, who's from Bolton, which is not too far away from where I come from, uh, up in the north, up north. <laughs> Uh, and of course the story is set in South East London, so it was nice to have that sort of regional accent. Um, but yeah, this was fun. I listened to this um, yesterday. Um, and I enjoyed it. Uh, as I say, I love the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn. They're really strong. Um, uh, companion, Doctor Companion duo. I love the characters in this, there were very interesting twists and turns and I didn't see the vampire, the vampire reveal coming. It comes about end of part two and I didn't see it coming. Um, I also did not expect um, a Zagreus reference in this. At one point in part one, the doctor like hums the Zagreus nursery rhyme to himself, just like sings it to himself out of nowhere and it really caught me off guard i'm aware of sagreus uh, i'm not particularly i'm not particularly aware of what happens in that story i know it's very weird i know it's about four hours long i know a lot of the doctors are in it but they're not really playing the doctor um and i know that it revolves around this nursery rhyme um and i've heard the, the audio clip of Paul McGann saying it in that story. Um, I think, what is it? Zagreus lives inside your head. Zagreus sits among the dead. No. Yeah, Zag Zagreus lives inside your head. Zagreus sits among the dead. Zagreus sees you in your bed and eats you when you're sleeping. And I've heard the clip of Paul McGann sort of saying it quite dramatically, which I've as I'm, as I'm aware is from that story but I had absolutely no idea that Colin Baker was going to sing it to himself like a real nursery rhyme in this story which it was quite quite exciting because I think we tend to think of the early days of Big Finish as kind of a little bit like throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks almost like they're a young company they're still figuring stuff out um and with the, the sort of arcs and stuff in play you've got the Dalek Empire arc sort of going on in stories like Genocide Machine Apocalypse Element Mutant Phase you've got you know the Eighth Doctor and Charlie in a beginning of an ongoing arc You've got this story which begins an arc uh, with with the forge, um, but I think I, I just didn't expect that in release number twenty three there was going to be something 
so undeniably set up for release number 50. Like, we're not even a halfway to that point, if that makes sense. We're not even halfway to 50 releases, and we've already got the Zagreus Nursery Rhyme in in the audios is there, it's been planted, which makes me think is it going to crop up again before the story is Zagreus, and I kind of hope it does, I kind of, I'm interested to get caught off guard by it, you know, in the same way to, in like Minuet in Hell, when there's a reference to the next story, Lucaroo, but that's like, you know, the next story along, of course that's going to be in the works while you're doing this one. But I just didn't think that Zagreus would be even... We're not even there yet. That's a year or two at least away. And it's already the seeds are being planted for it. I found that very interesting. Um, but I thought the story itself was also very good. I thought the characters were fun. It kind of got a little bit gruesome and a bit gory. But then when you realise it's playing with vampires... That makes sense. Um... I know, I'm fairly sure that Nimrod is a character who returns. I'll be interested to see if any of the other side characters in this story return. Um, in future Forge stories, Project Lazarus, Project Destiny, whatever they, whatever they are. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, uh, I enjoyed this one. Um. But I just kind of can't get past the Zagreus thing in a good way. It just totally caught me off guard and I really liked it. Um, and also, yeah, I just love the story and I love... If it's got the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn in it, I'm on board, basically. You know, like the Fifth Doctor stuff, I'm kind of... It's got to be a good story for me to really enjoy it. The Seventh Doctor stuff, I'm pretty on board with... Um, and it's mostly good, but, you know, can miss sometimes. But I just, every, basically every story with the Sixth Doctor so far, including, like, Whispers of Terror and uh, Holy Terror, which were both very strong, and I didn't even like Holy Terror as much as a lot of other people do. Um, but the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn have just been a real, like, uh, power couple for me, um, very quickly becoming, um, one of my favourite Doctor Companion teams, um, which is nice, I really like that fact, um, so I'm very, I'm looking forward to hearing what, whatever is next for them, uh, if I had to pick a favourite of these four, I enjoyed both the Sixth Doctor ones a great deal. Um, possibly Blood Tide a little bit more than um, Project Twilight. Oh, Blood Tide is the one where there's uh, stuff in that which, if you if you watch the YouTube channel Davis and the series Broke Cannon, you might be aware of this fact. It sort of implies that one Silurian created all of humanity. I, mean, I don't think it goes like f full, like confirms that outright, but it definitely strongly implies it, which is weird, but it kind of works in the story. <laughs> um, but I remember listening to that come up and be like, oh yeah, I remember this from Broke Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I think I enjoy Blood Tide slightly more than Project Twilight but I think I would have to go with Lucaroo as my favourite and what's interesting is that when I started recording this video literally as I hit record I didn't know what my favourite of these four was and I kind of talked myself into it I think being Lucaroo because it challenges the fifth doctor in a way that you wouldn't see on tv not only because it 
deals with werewolves and stuff that you wouldn't be able to do visually. Um, but it challenges the characters and the dynamics and the, the tone and the format of his era in a way that I found really interesting. Um, and you know that he, obviously the Doctor's not going to fall in love with this character and, and they go off in the sunset together, but you just don't see that kind of that kind of um, character drama with him, uh, and I really enjoyed that. But yeah, I thought these stories were all pretty good, pretty solidly consistent. Uh, the weakest I think was Dust Breeding, which was just a bit bland and a bit forgettable for me. Not bad, but um, uh, just unremarkable. But yeah, those are. Um, those are my thoughts on these next four stories. I will see you again uh, in about another month or so. Um, but yeah, thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Have you listened to these stories? What's your favourite? Um, let me know in the comments. Like the video if you liked it. And I will... Um, I will see you, as I say, in about a month for the next four stories being The Eye of the Scorpion, Colditz, Primeval, and The One Doctor. Thank you. Goodbye.